Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Renewables. I'm your host, David Smart. Thank you to all of our followers who have been tuning in week after week this season. Hope everyone had a great uh, holiday and into 2023, excuse me, um, and really appreciate everybody tuning in. Very excited about this week's episode. We have Jack Dweck, co-founder of Advanced Energy Capital, among other businesses. Uh, we're going to learn about today, a guy who has a great reputation in the energy business, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners and followers will know who you are, Jack. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, if you don't mind, just kind of, you know, dive in for us. You're a serial entrepreneur. You have a, you've started a lot of different companies. Take a step back first, though. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got into the energy business, and then and then tell us about your company. Okay, thank you. Um, so it, it, it all started uh, about 20, 25 years ago uh, when we, I was running a, a finance company. And we were financing energy suppliers or retail energy suppliers. Um, and that, that's, that's where, where it started, where New York became deregulated or became a choice state in 1997. Uh, very shortly after that, we were, we were in, the, um, in the financing game, uh, helping people with growth capital, equity capital. We financed about 20 or so retailers. And, um, and that's, how we got in, that's how we got into the energy space, really we're kind of from the finance business. Um, we today, I won't tell you about all the businesses I started since, since then and since the financial crisis. Um, I, I actually list it in a book that I wrote, which is on Amazon, uh, which, is called, uh, which is called Six Steps to Overcoming Adversity, uh, how, um, um, how to Turn Setbacks into Comebacks. And talk about what happened in the financial crisis in 2008 and, and what we did and, and, how, and how, we, how we survived. Um, barely survived, but thank God we've, we've made our comeback. So uh, that's out there. But right now uh, we have businesses that we've started. We, we founded my partner and myself. Uh, my partner's name is Rick Rudy. We've been working together since 1987 and partners since 1997. Um, so the main business is Advanced Energy Capital, which is, as I mentioned, it's a finance company. We, we finance energy projects, energy companies, mostly on the green side, we also do other types of things like green real estate deals and anything anything where you have the the the, the combination of energy, real estate, and finance. We get involved in. We have an uh, we have a company called AEC, which is Advanced Energy Capital AEC Energy, which is a commercial commercial real estate uh, energy management company. We have a, a commercial supplier, which is called Grid Power Direct, which works only with very very big, tall buildings, half a million square feet and up. Uh, in 12 states. We, start, we started a company about 10 years ago called Greenbacker. It was a renewable energy fund that we started with partners. And thank God that that has grown really nicely. And that's Greenbacker is now public and it's a three and a half billion dollar renewable energy fund uh, with a really good reputation. We've never missed a dividend in 10 years. Um, and I also run, uh, I also have a company called LED Plus, which is a retention program for We've sent out over 600,000 boxes of LEDs uh, to, to um, customers of retail suppliers in about 16 states. And finally, I run uh, an organization called the Energy Marketing Conference, which is now going into our 11th year and our 21st. We do two a year, one in Houston, one in New York City. And this is going into our 21st conference coming up in Houston in March, March 18th and 19th. That was, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Well, it's a lot to unpack. Uh, you've touched a lot of different spaces. Certainly very impressive. Congratulations on your success. Biostar started attending uh, the energy marketing conferences this year. We had some of our representatives there and, and that was uh, productive for us. So appreciate that. And um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, you know, most of what we talk about on this show is related to renewables and this sort of renewable transition that's underway. Uh, but you obviously can touch on that from a wholesale and retail standpoint from a lot of different places uh, based on what you just told us. So, you know, from your perspective, I guess, tell us 
tell us what you see happening right now, um, you know, whether it be in the wholesale, wholesale or retail energy space and especially regarding uh, renewable energy? Um, well, that's a great question. Uh, I have to tell you, I, I think if I narrow it down, there are two main trends going on in the retail energy space as with, with regards to renewable energy and the energy transition. Uh, the first, I would say, is something what I call verticality, uh, which means companies going vertical. Um, what does that mean? In the old days, the retailer, the you know, the retailer that's selling uh, widgets on uh, on on the thirty fourth street of Manhattan would be a little smarter and say, you know, instead of buying from the wholesaler, let me let me get on a plane, go to China, and buy it direct and cut out the middlemen. So what's happening in the re in the retail energy business is generators, people that are generating power, are learning. Uh, how to become wholesalers and the, not selling to wholesalers, but becoming wholesalers. And the wholesalers are becoming retailers, which is basically making it impossible for small to mid-sized businesses to compete on price with any of these gigantuan companies that companies like Shell, BP, hmm. EDF, Constellation, NG, NRG, there's a whole bunch of them, Calpine. These guys own generation, they're wholesale suppliers and they're retailers that go directly to the consumer and they sell. So how is it possible for the small to mid-sized business to ever compete with them uh, on price? Uh, I would say it is impossible. The second, um, the second trend going on in the industry is that the retail energy providers and wholesalers too, by the way, are changing their names and they're changing their missions to, and they're changing their product offerings to coincide with the push in this country towards ESG and the energy transition. So let me give you examples of that. Uh, there are new names in this industry. Uh, I'll, I'll name a couple of them for you. I've been in this space a long time. I've been running um, conferences in this space for 10 years. So these are all relatively new names. I mean, Green Mountain Energy is not a new name, um, which is of course owned by NRG, but Clean Choice Energy, Inspire Clean Energy, Clean Sky Energy used to be called Titan. Apex Clean Energy, ATG Clean Energy, Green Green Choice Energy, Green Light Energy, uh, and there's, it goes on and on. The, the companies are changing their names and putting the word clean and green in them, but it's not just a name change. They're also offering 100% renewable source product. They're offering renewable natural gas in some cases. They're offering community solar, and that's their procurement products. They're also offering services or partnerships with third parties. Um, I think I, I, I announced a couple of years ago that Direct Energy, which is now owned by NRG, had sold something like 400,000 customers Nest thermostats that's owned by Google in one year. 400,000, it was some crazy number. But Nest thermostats is a good example. Uh, of course, not only community solar, but regular solar. The, the retailers are getting into solar in a big way battery storage, demand response for the larger customers, energy efficiency measures, all different types of energy efficiency measures that are being sold and embedded into the procurement conversation. So um, the answer to, I, I kind of asked the question in my, in my first, my verticality leads to small to mid-sized businesses can't compete on price. So the answer is they can compete when it comes to more creative solutions for customers that involve the things that they care about and their their values and reducing load and also you know carbon neutrality and saving the planet and that's that's going to be probably where th this continues in this in this direction and, and what most people are focused on interesting very interesting yeah it's uh you know the latter part of what you discussed we we like because uh we think that you know uh, developing renewable energy projects takes trust and takes time and resources. And uh, so, you know, we like the retailers serving as sort of that that expert for their customers as they evaluate these things, because I think folks really do want a, a trusted expert. And so those relationships are obviously extremely valuable. Interesting, you mentioned, though, the small to mid-sized businesses, and there has been a lot of um, <clears throat> consolidation, it seems, in the the retail and brokerage space, especially as of late. So that's interesting. Regarding procurement, this is kind of a loaded question, uh, but you know, just given everything going on in the world right now and, and the state of the market, if you will, uh, what do you view as a winning 
procurement strategy in, in 2024 and beyond? What should people be doing? Um, and of course, especially related to renewables, what should people be doing you know, to, as they look into the future? Well, that, that's, a, that's another good question. So I think, I think that question breaks down into, uh, in terms of procurement, it breaks down into whether you're a, a large user of power, uh, um, you know, a large user like a, you know, a big facility, uh, a big, big, big real estate project, et cetera, or you're a consumer, you know, with your, with a, you know, with a two family home or apartment or a single family home. Um, if you're, if you're, if you're in the latter category, let's call that mass market, right? Category where you're using, call it 10,000 kilowatt hours a year or something like that. And that can, that category, um, then the, the winning strategy there, uh, I would say is to try to do everything you can to, um, to reduce the load because the grid can't handle it and your pocketbook can't handle it and the prices are not going not going down anytime soon. So um, reducing load, whether it be uh, you know uh, by getting more control over what your what what's be, what's uh, what's causing all that friction and what's causing the load to happen, and then getting more control over it. Uh, there are things you can do if you have an EV charger, for example. There are there there are time of use kind of programs that you can get involved in. That char I, I charge my Tesla, for example, at midnight every night. So I, I I'm assuming that the the rates are a lot cheaper, and Con Ed actually sends me money back when I do that. So that's on the mass market side. On the on the larger scale side, there are three ways to procure power. One is variably, which is on a daily basis, just like just like a utility does. Um, which is not a terrible strategy, by the way. The other one is fixed, but you lock yourself up for a couple of years, which if anybody has done that in 2022, they got a very, very bad deal because in 2023, the prices went down about 40%. So, you know, so, so long-term fixed pricing, I'm not a big fan of. Uh, it's just it's just gambling uh, as opposed to what, what people normally think of that. They think of that as, you know, budget certainty and look, I got a great deal. I, I locked in at a, at a rate for the next three years. So, Naturally, you think that's great because you think that naturally the price of power always goes up, which is not the case. Uh, and then, then the third strategy, which is I'm a big proponent of, is something called block and index, which means during the year you 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 run on the index, you just run it variably because you don't we don't see any spikes for tw in 24 years of in this business. The only spikes in power happen in the summer and winter. So in this, what you do is you hedge the summer and you hedge the winter and you leave the what we call the shoulder months. Uh, to buy variably, and that's that's actually been a great strategy. We've been running it for seven years, and it works really well. Is there more risk today in the in the shoulder months uh, than maybe there used to be? You know, if you just look at twenty twenty two, you'd say yes. But if you look at a little wider a wider lens, uh, you, you, the years like twenty twenty two happen. Um, but by and large, over the last like 15 years, I mean, with, with a couple of exceptions, um, the, 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 the price of power has not really gone up much um, over, the, over time. I mean, 2008, for example, uh, I remember the beginning of the year, the price we were in the gas business in those days, natural gas price per therm was 60 cents uh, per therm in, in January. In December, it was, it was $1.80, and everybody was rushing to, mm. to fix the pricing and then in 2009, the prices went back down to 70 cents or 80 cents. So everybody that locked in because they were they were they were convinced by the brokers to say, "Oh boy, the price is going up. It's never going to come down again." That really wasn't true. And uh, so I'm not, like I said, I'm not a big fan of long-term fixed pricing uh, because looking at it from a longer perspective, uh, it's not a it's not a winning strategy in terms of lower cost. What about long term, 10, 20, 30 years, like on a oh, renewable that's energy a different story. TPA. That's a different story because then, then you're not only locking in something for an extended period of time, hopefully with not a lot of increases per year, uh, but you're also cleaning right. up the energy and, and you know doing it more efficiently. Um, so, yeah, so putting, putting solar on your roof, as an example, is, uh, is a whole different story. And, or if you're, if you're a building and you have space to put, Solar on, on top of your carports, for example, that's another great great way people are are, are greenifying themselves and also reducing cost. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. That could have been a very controversial uh, segment there on the podcast. We always welcome uh, good dialogue 
and uh, back and forth, but but glad to hear you're a fan of of renewable PPAs. That's obviously what Biostar does. So if anybody's uh, listening here and interested in exploring on-site generation, we're your, we're your folks. <laughs> have to plug the company every once in a while. So you're heading into your 11th year, bringing together energy professionals uh, at your semi-annual energy marketing conference. Tell us about EMC. Tell us about what that's been like and what you've got planning for what you've got planned. Excuse me for 2024. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so EMC, as you know, has been running for 10 years. We run one conference a year in Houston and and the other in, in March and the other conference. We run. We used to run it in New York City every fall, and 2024 we're we're planning on being in Caesar's Palace in the fall, but staying in Houston in March, and then New, and then Caesar's Palace um, in September. The, the the conference the the theme of the next conference, which is EMC 21, which is mitigating risk in retail energy, where we we're planning on having 10 pre-conference sessions like the last one, an opening night reception with a famous band that we've not mentioned the name yet that's going to be playing. Uh, a big name keynote speaker the day of the conference. Um, we're having fastball, which is 10 pitchers that come on stage for four minutes each and pitch their services that are new to the industry. And then we vote on them and give them an award. We also are handing out the, mentioning the nominees for the Retail Energy Provider year, uh, of the Year Award for, for 2023. Um, we also have this program called the Supplier Broker Exchange. So commercial brokers, um, with commercial suppliers, will have the opportunity to have their own kind of um, let's call it an exhibitor hall together, where they can do a lot of you know focused networking. There'll be forty exhibitor booths and fifty speakers. Really, a lot of networking opportunities. As obviously the CEO roundtable, as we have every every year. Um, we also are running a, a special session for large users of power in the state of Texas. Uh, people, hopefully, people like HEB and big big name. Companies that use a ton of power are going to tell, share their perspectives with us, a closing night reception. And we're also planning a special event the day after the conference for people who want, for people who want to continue the networking. So we, we, we have a lot going on, a lot planned, and it's, 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 uh, we're getting a lot of amazingly enthusiastic response from people and, and, and energy professionals all, literally all over the world. We have people coming from Europe, from Japan, from Australia, and a ton of people coming from the Midwest in places like Dallas, Houston, Austin, and of course, uh, you know, even even on the West Coast, they come to the Houston conference. That's fantastic! Congratulations on the growth and the success with EMC. I'm certainly looking forward to uh, attending those next year, and I know some other members of our team are as well. So, as you think about, you know, you've been in this business a long time now, um, 10, 15, 20, Who's counting, right? Uh, but as you look towards look towards the future, you know what excites you the most? I guess about the the future of the energy market, uh, and I guess really about your business. Oh, thanks, uh, thanks for that question. I, th I think we're if I think about it, like I said, with a wide lens, I, I would say we're we're at the precipice. Uh, you know, there was an industrial revolution sixty years ago or so. This is a new type of revolution in an industry. The whole world is changing. Uh, the United States is keeping up pretty nicely, I would say, with the rest of the world. Um, definitely better than some of the, um, you know, better than China, better than a lot of other places that are not really keeping up with this transition. But there's incredible opportunities for companies coming up with completely new ideas and that can help with this transition. Let me give you an example of that. Um, I, I met with a company last week that is doing floating solar. You heard me right, floating yeah. solar. In other words, you know, there's a lot of wetlands in this country that people buy 40 acres to develop and there's two or three acres that are just disgusting. You can't do anything about them. You can't even fix them. You're not even, you, you can't build on them, but they found a way to put solar panels and a whole solar barrage, you know, uh, whatever they call it, on top of that. Uh, they can do this in rivers. They can do this. And it would be amazing if they can uh, you try to implement this on the Hudson River, New York City, so that New York City, which is Zone J of New York, of Con Edison, could get all of a sudden get become buildings there could get compliant with Local Law 97 in New York, and all of a sudden get solar in the zone that they're operating in, which is today it's completely impossible. Um, so, so th those are the kinds of that's just one example, but there are so many examples of companies that are coming up with new ways to for storage for energy storage, new ways for 
a biodiesel, you know, to convert, you know, um, junk to, into energy. And, and, and I just read, I just read about an Israeli company yesterday that's doing something with ocean waves and using the ocean, literally using the ocean to generate power, um, for, for inland, um, projects, like amazing, amazing opportunities. The world, I think the, for sure, America, this country is focused completely on, on getting to carbon neutrality at some point. And if you're an entrepreneur or a business person in this space and you're, if you're not able to figure out a way to, uh, to capitalize on it, something's wrong there. Uh, one more example. I, I have a friend of mine who was out of work for a while. Uh, he's a salesman trying to find the right niche. And he came up with this company that is doing, he's, he's basically putting EV chargers in malls and pay, he raised the money to pay for it and doing a rev share with the mall owner. So the mall owner has no out of pocket and he's just uh, gonna benefit uh, from the, the move towards EVs in this country. And, and you know, he, he pitched it to me as an investment, potential investment for us. But I, I just, I just thought, thought to myself, you know, after the phone call, I said, uh, you know, look, look what's going on here. This is a guy that was just doing regular sales not involved in energy, not involved in anything with the with the renewables or transition. And he's another great example of someone who's gonna be a multimillionaire within the next year or two, uh, involved in the EV, I would say, let's call it the EV transition, you know? Sure. Yeah, and it's a perfect segue, you know, to one of my questions for you, which is, you know, there's a lot of opportunities out there, some of them newer than others, uh, and some really exciting. As somebody who's running, you know, an energy finance company, where is advanced energy capital investing mostly these days? Um, okay, great question. I would say two areas. Uh, one is we are we started a, um, a platform. We call it AEC Green Energy. Uh, I'm sorry, AEC Green Real Estate. And what we're doing is multifamily buildings. We're buying the multifamily. We're not building them from scratch but we're buying them from owners who don't know how to comply with all the local laws and don't know anything about energy transition or anything mm. or renewables or EV or solar or anything. And so we want to buy those buildings and then we want to implement uh, all the things we've learned over the last 15 years um, to implement you know, all different types of energy efficiency measures and solar and put EV charging, et cetera. And then um, um, hopefully that will add a lot of value to the real estate um, and hopefully that would be that, that's going to be a great platform. And the other thing we do is we um, any anything in the SMB world, the small to mid-sized business world, where they're looking for capital to 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 move their businesses forward. And of course, in the usually in the green energy space uh, is where we find the most opportunity. Um, people that they're they're maxed out of their bank line, or it's it's very difficult to get bank lines. Uh, we we come to the table and we. We could put a factoring um, program together, but then we we do we, we have something called stretch factoring, which basically means we're putting up capital with very little collateral, but giving them the opportunity to prove that their that their businesses will work and and will get paid back. Hopefully, we'll continue to get paid back. <laughs> interesting, very interesting. All right, well, last question. I asked you what excites you, what keeps you up at night whether or not people pay you so back. So 68% of this country <laughs> is not does not have energy choice, right? So 16 out of 50 states, you could you have a choice of a supplier. In the other 34 states, we're looking at um, you have no choice. You have to be buying from the from the local monopoly or your local utility. Um, so that's the first mm -hmm. problem. It's, it's been a very, very difficult to open up choice around the country. Uh, we know choice works. We have we have unlimited amount of proof case texts uh, show that we could show we could show that the that having a hundred different choices of where you buy your power is a be, is better than having only one choice um, but we can't seem to get that word out and that's that's what keeps me up at night that along with correlation to that is some bad press that the industry gets from bad actors uh, we don't get any good press that's for sure um, and then we have uh, uh, you know the regulatory environments in in many states are are just you know, are antagonistic towards retail choice. And I don't know if it comes from yeah. the bad, I don't know if it's chicken or the egg. I don't know what comes first. Um, but the, the just my goal is to help companies uh, and non -for nonprofits um, such as uh, the, the retail, there's retail choice coalition and there's 
There's a bunch of others, uh, RISA, for example, Retail Energy Supplier Association, um, and, and a number of others that are working hard to, for adv advocacy uh, around the country to try to allow states to open up. I, I worked hard on a on a petition in Florida. We got about 600,000 names. We still couldn't even get it on the ballot because Florida Power and Light, too powerful, um, and they ran TV commercials, and we lost. We, we also, we didn't lose. We didn't even get a chance to, for a vote. The same thing happened in Nevada. So it's it's a it's it's a difficult it's difficult in this country to get retail choice open, and that will give consumers a lot more choices and uh, a lot more a lot more uh, power really for them to do what they want to do and, and pick what they want to pick. If they if you live in Minnesota right now and you want to want to want to be 100 percent green, how do you do it? You 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 can't call your local yeah. utility. Hi, I want to I want to buy Rex. You know it doesn't work that way. So so that's that's what keeps me up at night. Yeah, I've been saying for a while now, I would trade all, you know, everyone talks about the incentives in our industry and the renewable energy business anyways. And I say I would trade all the incentives for a, a fair regulatory environment, right? right? right. Um, and giving folks the choice and the freedom, like you said, to do what they mm -hmm. want to do <clears throat> is powerful and would generate, I believe, a lot of really uh, positive distributed energy projects across the mm -hmm. country. So Jack, appreciate everything you're doing for the industry. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and looking forward to seeing you at least twice next year. Uh, wish you a great holiday season and a great winter. And uh, thank you very you much for coming on the pleasure. show. It's been thank a pleasure. Thank you so much. Good luck with the podcast. God bless. Thank you very much. Everyone who's listening and who follows along, we appreciate you very much as well. Uh, thanks for, for tuning in this week. And please remember to click that follow button wherever you listen to your podcasts. This has been another episode of Renewables. I'm your host, David Smart. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America.